that I that I thought really it typified the era in that sort of light adult age group was up up and away. It's funny the songs I pick. You by chance had asked me why why did you pick the songs you picked? Um, I really want the songs that I that I pitched. You know, to to the editor, to my editor, the songs that I wanted to do. I they wanted them to be immediately recognizable when the reader saw the title, mm-hmm. but they weren't played. And what I mean by that is they're not in advertising. You know, you don't hear them all the time. With, when I interviewed Keith Richards for um, Make It Street, So Hard, yeah, no, uh, my first book, he was almost apologetic when he he said, "Oh, hey, Mark, what, what song do you want to do?" He says, "He says." Uh, I said, well, what are you thinking? What are you thinking, Keith? He goes, oh, I was going to talk about Street Fighting Man. And I and he goes, but I can talk about Jumping Jack Flash. I can talk about Saturday. Satisf- <laughs> I mean, if you want to do, he was almost, he was almost apologetic. Like he, he was pulling me to the main highway of, sure. of the Stones. And I said, no, I said, no, 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 no. Let's do Street Fighting Man. And he said, I said, my brother and I fought over that 45 when that <laughs> thing came out. I said, there's a lot of fascinating stuff going on in there. And he goes, well, I want talk about it because i had i had you know the strongest hand in it you know you know mostly everything else is you know mick and me but i i really had a lot to do a lot more to do with that song so there there's an example like if i were going to interview members of the doors if they were still around i mean i interviewed right. the doors for my first mm-hmm. um my first book light my fire but if if uh, you know three of them were still here there's only Right, Robbie right. Krieger um, and uh, if, if, John Densmore. Yeah, if, if they're three, I would want to do Touch Me because it's offbeat. You see what I'm saying? Yes. It's a great song, but it's just not one of the mainstream. So the songs that I picked, I wanted to be a bit off, you know, a exactly. bit not part of this. And Up, Up and Away was always such a strange song for me. I mean, I loved it, but it's like it's it's one of those songs where I don't know anybody who was who's who I don't know anybody riding in a car. I, I don't know anybody who's ever said or admitted, I don't know if anybody could ever take a lie detector test to this, that when Up, Up and Away came on, they turned it off. Because the opening has that that big, brassy Mar- Mar- Marty Page. It's just a sensational opening. And then the song itself is just, you really feel like you're flying away. I mean, it's just impossible. There's something about that song that, and I wanted to know what the secret was behind that song. Why is it that I feel that? It's like grooving. Who turns off grooving when right. it comes on by the rascals? So, and you, you know, there's a lot of songs you turn off. And I'm saying some of these songs, you might turn off September in, in Anatomy of 55 more songs, but up, up and away, no one's ever turned that mm. thing off when it's. T- and you know, t- interviewing Jimmy Webb was terrific to get every every last ounce of what went into that song, how it came about. The story behind it is just it was un- unbelievable to me. Yeah, it was you fascinating. Think? Yeah. That yeah. that it, but I it, wish it, you would have asked him one question. Yeah. <laughs> and the question was I'm sorry, give it to me. Put the cake out in the rain. Well, that's MacArthur Park, right? I know, I know, but still, you know, yeah. it's the one question everyone asks. Yeah, well, I mean, MacArthur Park actually exists. See, that's the reason I didn't do MacArthur Park, right? Because mm-hmm. it's been done to death. You know, if you go to Wiki, it's all there, um, and it's almost like there's not going to be an answer to your question because that's the art of it, right? That's yes. that's the clashing of words. That's sunshine Superman. What does that mean? He, he Donovan loved the two words together. I mean, there was a meaning why he chose to. Sunshine is a reason why he chose Superman. But putting those two words together, it just sounded to the artist. It, it was a fun combination. Right. You know, it was irresistible. Right. And that's, you know, up, up and away. I mean, where that song was originally Jimmy Webb wrote that while he was at community college under the under the assumption that the DJ who suggested they write a song together was interested in creating a treatment for a movie that instead of teenagers and cars would be teenagers and ballooning in the desert. I mean, that's what that song, that's what, that's what Jimmy Webb was thinking when he was writing that song, which it's like, you have to remember the beach movie was so hot when up, up and away was written originally the the music. And it just, it's, that's the, that's, that's the, it's a cinematic theme song you would have to a teenage, to, to a couple, you know, falling in love while ballooning. 
you know, with everybody, with all their friends in, in, in the California desert. You know, once you, I mean, it's words and music by Jimmy too. So, and then the, the whole idea comes to him because he gets taken up, uh, you know, in a tethered balloon a hundred feet and couldn't believe how the sun was coming through the, the panels of fabric, which looked almost like stained glass. And he just felt, wow, this is it's like up, up and away. But the title, I mean, the title Up, Up and Away actually came from his youth. It was it was what if you go back to the if you li- go to YouTube and listen to the to the radio broadcast, not the television, but the radio broadcast of Superman. That's what Superman said yes. before he took off up, <laughs> up and away. And that's that's <laughs> yeah. where that title comes from. So that's the great thing about these songs. There's all these little nuggets of information that tell you it, it's the various parts of how this thing that you loved listening to and still do how it all came together how this crazy thing managed to happen yeah and and one of the things i'm going to try and find when we play this song i don't know if you remember but when twa was an actual airline oh of course and they used this particular song as an advertisement i think it was pan am no no twa no but that wasn't up up and i i anyway like one of those two airlines. But yeah, I mean, it was just a natural, you know, it's a natural fit. It's like yeah, advertising yeah. takes songs today. You suddenly hear a song you loved for like some medication to stop heart attacks. You know, it's like so depressing. It's yeah, like big you never get into, Yeah, you can, you just you mentally just cross that song off from ever listening to it again. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I mean, one that's of the, the destructive no, thing about I, advertising. I, I, I beg to differ. I just got it. Heart medication? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to fly up, up and away? Wouldn't you like to fly up and away? If you'll take our hand, we'll chase your dream across the sky. For we can fly, we can fly up, up and away. How beautiful, how beautiful to fly. Pick a star in the twilight canopy And search the world for the sights you long to see Your heart is young, you're alive, so come with me T-W-A Up, up and away What is that, David? TWA. Oh, that's your TWA. Well, one of the things readers are going to take away from this book is the importance of the role of the producer in all this, because we don't think about producers. We just we know the the names and the faces on the on the record cover. They often had they often made the final call that actually made it a hit. Well, you you that yeah. is no more demonstrated than in uh, Bob Ezrin when you talk about uh, Alice Cooper's um, Alice 18, Cooper. which was a anthem for my generation. And that there was this epic Alice Cooper jam that he didn't even get the lyrics to right. And he says, come on, guys, we got to dumb it down. And he turned it into that three chord uh, toward the force in there. Alice Cooper in 1970, 71 was on the fast track to obscurity. They were. Easy two action, t- yeah. They right. were two ticks away from working in a shoe store. I mean, <laughs> they were over and done. Their first two albums just did not generate anything yes. whatsoever. And they were going to get dropped. And they had one more shot. And because Bob Ezrin felt strongly about them after seeing them at CBGB, he said uh, to the label owner, I forget the label, but um, uh, he said- uh, It was well, Warner Brothers. Yeah, but it was, uh, it was a Canadian- They were on straight. They were on straight. Yeah, records. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. And he said to the exactly. guy who owned the, the, owner, the owner of the company, said, get rid of these guys. Go down, let's go down to New York and fire them. That's why I'm sending you down. You got you got a ticket, round trip ticket. Uh, you're leaving tomorrow morning. Your job is to go there, fire these guys. They're just not happening. We got to get somebody else. We can't afford this anymore. And so Ezrin goes down to fire them. And at CBGB, freaks out. I mean, the people there are just animated. They're wearing eye makeup. You right. know, Alice mm-hmm. Cooper. It's just a whole theatrical thing. And I think when Bob is, he's so excited 
he actually Bob wasn't going down to produce them. He was going down to fire them, as I just said. And he right. goes down there and he he rushes backstage. And I forgot how he botches the name of the title. I'm you edgy. Think, you tell us. I'm yeah. edgy. Yeah. yeah I'm edgy, he goes, yeah. I love that song. I'm edgy. And like Alice Cooper, the band's looking at him like like, are you stoned or what's the problem? <laughs> he goes, no, no, your song, that last song, I'm, I didn't have anything to drink. I'm edgy. That's great. And you know, no, 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 no. That's how I'm 18. I'm 18. You know, they, they couldn't quite make it out. And uh, uh, Ezra couldn't make it out. Yeah, yeah, I'm 18. He goes, I'm going to produce you. I'm going to produce yeah. you. And he rush, goes back to Canada. He says to his boss, he said, boss says, hey, good to see you, Bob. He goes, so did they take it hard? You know, how did you tell him? And he goes, no, no. He goes, yeah. I'm, I'm going to produce their next album. And he goes, Bob, I sent you down there to can these guys. He goes, no, no, they're great. I'm telling you, it's going to work. I'm telling you, they got a great song. It's going to hit. The guy goes, fine. You produce them. And if it doesn't work out, you and Alice Cooper, I'll be sending somebody to fire you and <laughs> Alice Cooper. Yeah. So right. Bob Bob basically says, you know, Shep at this point, uh, you know, uh, Shep, uh, Shep, Shep, takes Gordon. Them. Shep Gordon's already mm -hmm. moved them to the Midwest because the Midwest is you know it's where their records are doing best right um and it's also where it's also the part of the country that's suffering the most economically um unions i mean the the factories are all moving overseas um factories are shuttering um parents are getting divorced because dads are sitting around watching tv all day the wife has to go to work to, to put food on the table dad feels emasculated they're fighting all the time kids want out of the house so the kids are really responding to all the groups in the midwest like mc5 and Iggy. right you mentioned this grand yeah. funk yeah yeah so alice is up there and they're i think in pontiac they rented a ranch right and they're playing in the barn and ezrin's got them rehearsing there and they play I'm 18 for Ezrin. And Ezrin, as you point out, Tom, is like, doesn't understand the lyrics. They're singing too many of them. It's just jammed. There's too many notes. And what Ezrin does as a producer is he basically takes he takes the design apart and realizes he can reassemble what they're doing with far fewer parts mm -hmm. so that audiences can have a better experience. And if it wasn't for the producer uh, in that case, you would never know who Alice Cooper is or was. Right, right. And an important, he, he plays us in a role, uh, an important role in the, in the history of rock concerts, as you wrote in, in your previous book. One of the, uh, another one I really enjoyed was, uh, you got to talk to Bernie Taupin. Yeah. And his most regretted lyric is Mars is cold as hell because Mars isn't cold yeah. as hell. How was Bernie yeah, that, to, talk it's a, to <laughs> talk to about? It's a privilege. It's, it's yeah. a, it's a privilege. Yeah. I have to tell you. I mean, yeah. To interview these people, I don't interview these people because I'm interviewing A-list actors every week. Right. I mean, I'm up to my 500th column, actually, in January for House Call. Wow. I, I'm, this isn't I mean, I, I'm not a fan. I I am a fan of of their art. Yeah. I'm not a fan of their celebrity. Yeah. So We're when I come to. Yeah, when I come to talk to these people, they know that I'm not there because I'm fawning over them or that I have all right. of your albums or I know every one of your lyrics. Here, let me sing them for you. I'm coming to them as someone who has enormous respect for what they do in terms of their art. And, you know, when I sent my pitch in to sort of, you know, interview Bernie, I basically wrote that. And I said, I'm not, I don't want to talk about trash. I'm not here to talk about gotcha. I'm not yes. here to talk about garbage, rehab, ex-wives. I'm just here to talk about the craft of what you do, yeah. the art. And, you know, I, I got word, you know, this person called up and said, Bernie wants you to come out, come out to California and wow. do it out there. So I flew out and we sat down for about an hour and 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, it's a ranch in California. Yes. That's yeah, but we did it. We the, did uh, it in, connection. I think we did it in, it was either Century City or Wilshire. I can't remember okay. where we did it, but, um, we did it in a, in a conference room and he was, we, we had the greatest time. I mean, we, he just took me, we, he, he knew, he sensed immediately that I knew as much as or more <laughs> than he did about the story, um, <laughs> and that I was going to push him and turn him upside down for stuff that I would shake things out that he forgot or had repressed or wherever it was. Yeah. And, you know, he took me through the whole, you know, step by step, blow by blow. Driving to his parents' Elton house. That's together. Yep, up at the yeah. parents' house yeah. and Elton's mom's house. And, you know, when he was when he was driving up to see, he he took the train. I, he drove up to see his parents 
right. in, 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 you know, two hours, two to three hours outside of London. And by the time he got off the highway, um, it was dark. And as he's driving the back lanes and roads up there, um, which you can't drive very fast on, you, you, know, you can go fast, but you can't go very fast because they twist and turn. Right. Um, he's looking at the sky and he can see the stars because it's pitch black in the countryside there. And he's starting to think of uh, Ray Brad, the Ray Bradbury story. And he starts to come up with the first verse in his head. But this is pre-cell phone and pre electronics sure. and pre anything and he he can't he can't write he can, he doesn't have a pen to pull over and start writing it on paper so bernie is basically repeating the verse over and over for the next hour as he's driving to his parents house when he finally pulls onto the gravel driveway and pulls in and he jumps out of the car storms past his parents who wonder what the heck's wrong with them and he rushes up or rushes inside and grabs a pen and dashes down the lyric that he had for for Rocket Man. And that was the start of it. And the interesting thing I think that's most fascinating about the um, Bernie Elton relationship, artist relationship, is that the lyrics always came first. Yes. Which seems inconceivable. Right. right. You know, it's just you would just always imagine like if if. Bernie wrote rock the lyrics to Rocket Man that the music would have he would have listened to the, a tape of Elton's piano sure. playing and come up with that, but no he wrote the lyrics to that first Rocket Man. So if you look at the you know people listening, if you just look at the lyrics to Rocket Man, imagine you are writing that, and that's all you're handing off to Elton, yes. and then Elton sees the visual, he sees the drama, he sees the 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 operatic quality. He sees the power ballad because Rocket Man is one of the greatest. It's it, for me, it's one of the top five power ballads ever recorded. Yes. It just builds and builds and builds. And the fact that those words came first and that Elton put, set those words to music is in and of itself from an artistic standpoint is I, I was thunderstruck. Um, yeah. But I, that's mean, I always knew method. that that's how they were. Yeah, that's that's, that's huh? really remarkable. Yeah. 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 Especially and, Rocket Man, because it's, it, they're spare, but they're complicated. And yes. they're complicated, but they're not overly sophisticated. But they're not overly sophisticated to the point that you can't understand them. I mean, that's... Yeah. Well, you point I, out in the in the essay that he he's talking about the mundane life of an astronaut. And when that record came out in 72, Americans were bored with moon landings. They didn't even... Get ratings. I think the last moon landing was in 72 or 71. Yeah, this there song had nothing to do with Bowie's space. Uh, right, you know, of course. That we know. Yeah, which you pointed space out. Space Odyssey, it and it had nothing to do with Rocket similar. Man by, uh, what was the name of the group? I, I mentioned it in the book, but there's yes, a group. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a group that had Rocket, the title right. Rocket Man. And th he had, they had heard, they had heard none of those or didn't, st n neither one was an influence. Right. But, and then when I realized that, if you look at the date when it was written, it was right around the moon landing when yes. everybody in this country was absolutely captivated by Walter Cronkite and the eagle has landed and that. Gee, right, but that was 69. God, there's somebody but, on the moon. Right. But by yeah. 72, we didn't really care about moon. I remember it didn't even get no, yeah, that but much they, coverage on the people news. People yeah. forget that there were no. like. 10 other moon landings, right? Sure. Where they took a car up there and drove right. around and they Golf took balls samples. with Alan Shepard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it, there's, there's a lot of, you know, that one, that original moon landing was just one of them. But right. it, what it what what all those other landings meant to Bernie as he was writing is that going to the moon became like garbage collection. Yeah. You know, it was like it was like the shuttle. It was like yeah. not, not even the shuttle, but it was sort of like routine. You know, yeah, it, okay. it was routine. Yeah. It was like yeah. it was like taking out the trash. And that's that's the feeling he got in that song that. And that uh, combined with the Ray Bradbury story, which is that being an astronaut isn't special anymore. Right. It's like driving a truck. Incidentally, a quick uh, Walter Cronkite point. I think it was about a week and a half ago, his uh, townhouse on 84th Street just sold. <laughs> and I was fascinated. It sold for about 8.4, which I thought was you know, rather uh, a low price for uh, a it's, full it's, a, it's a, it's a, yeah, The amazing thing is that the person who lives there is probably dishonest because they have that much money. I mean, it just seems in our culture today, the only way that you get that kind of money, unless you're an artist, 
honest unless you're talented is through dishonesty. You know, like you took it from somebody else. So <laughs> imagine that, you know, it's almost like this Twilight Zone episode where, you know, a, a very dishonest person is now living in a house of truth. Like that's where the most honest person in the news business lived. You know, <laughs> right, it's almost right. like the ghosts of truth, the, the, the truth ghosts are going to haunt the dishonest person. Don't get on the ship. It's a cookbook. I know. <laughs> right. Uh, we're here. We're here to serve man. This is flight number nine one four from Earth to our planet. We will be taking off in three minutes. <sighs> Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers, don't get on that ship. The rest of the book to serve man. It's it's a cookbook. <laughs> That's it. So I want to give you the list of the 10 songs that were my favorites in the book. And let, let's pick another few to talk about if you have time. We'll obviously walk on by. Up, yeah, up no, I, I think I brought my sleeping bag. I'm here. I think Good. you guys wanted me here until like next Thursday, right? Yes, that's it's like fine. the Jerry that's, Lewis that's telephone. Fine. I'll, I'll get you some milk and cookies. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, we, gotta have to have, but, uh, we have to have somebody conduct the Count Basie band. Go ahead. That's it. We've got Paranoid. Bang a Gong, which incidentally was the first million seller that my brother in law played on. Wow. Rocket Man. Played on. Yeah, he was um, Ian McDonald. Oh, he no just kidding. passed away. Wow. Yeah. Smoke on the Water. Hello, It's Me. Love is the Drug. Hello, It's Me. Accidents Will Happen. And Take It Too Hard. Those were my like 10 favorites. So, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> well, I mean, tell me which one. I mean, what? You, Who was you know, the most reluctant? To, you you mentioned in the book that some artists are, are, tend to shy away from talking about their older material. Did did you find that with any of these folks that you talked with? No, because they talk to me about the past. I'm saying okay. others, other artists okay. that I've tried to get mm. um, tend to veer away from that because they don't want to talk about the past. Pete Townsend doesn't like to yeah. do that. Bono doesn't do that. Paul's talked out. Uh, you know, there isn't anything. Yeah. I mean, anthology basically did my job for me a long right. time. There's nothing, there's nothing more to get out of him. Although I really did. The only song I wanted to interview him on um, was Maybe I'm Amazed uh, okay. for a variety of reasons, which isn't a Beatles song. It's it's a McCartney song prior to Wings, right? But um, uh, Dylan said yes. Denny said no. Denny mm -hmm. said yes. Denny said no. So uh, <laughs> that was an almost. And at the time, Bruce wasn't looking back either. So okay. I, I did try to get everybody for this column. Um, did pretty well, all things considered. But those guys, I would say, were not really in the market to go back in time to revisit a they were more interested in talking about the new album they had coming out, sure. and they just felt it was a waste of time to be talking about something that dated. And we wanted to talk to Paul and not bring up the Beatles. <laughs> well, we enjoyed, we really enjoyed the uh, Rick Rubin uh, McCartney 321. I thought that was a new take on McCartney that no one had ever done before, where they just, uh, you know, it was just him and uh, Rick Rubin in the studio. I thought that was pretty, pretty innovative anyway. But David, go ahead, pick out a song, pick out one. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, press J7. It's like a jukebox. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Let, let's do, um, let's do Smoke on the Water. Everyone <laughs> knows that. I'm thinking that should make a great klezmer tune. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, pick another one only because I, I, you know, it's a great story, but I think the basics. I mean, we'd need we'd need quite some time to sort of for me to get to the. All right, uh, how, 
I well, think everybody kind of knows that the place caught fire, and these guys watched the place. You know, watched the the right. the um, uh, Montreux uh, concert hall burn, right. and they were sitting in a bar, and they wrote smoke on the water, but they couldn't get to record where they you know, so they couldn't record there, and then where they wanted to record next, they got thrown out of it. But they got the initial riff down. But there's a lot of great stuff in the book on it. It's just too there's just too many twists and turns there. I think you're okay, though. How about um, either Bang a Gong or Love is the Drug? Pick which one you'd like to do. Well, you, we can do, we can do, I mean, actually, did you, you mentioned burning down the house, right? Yes. No. Oh, no, we didn't. No, I'm sorry. No? Mm-mm. Let's do yeah, yes. well, You know what? Hello, It's Me, I think. Let's do Hello, It's Me. Because, you know, Hello, It's Me it has such an interesting love story attached to it. The interesting thing, first of all, Todd is a great guy. Yes. I mean, and he's, he's just... been re-exploring his back catalog now. I think he's more comfortable with it than he used to be because now he's doing like Wizard True Star in its entirety and he's reaching back on, on the concert. Yeah, stage. I mean, back when I yeah. interviewed him, he wasn't. Yeah, right. But he was willing to. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was what's interesting about Todd is that he's so brilliant and eclectic. You know, he's a producer. He's a songwriter. He's a musician. Um, he has incredible vision. I mean, he's always a step ahead in terms of seeing what things should do. And he's, you know, who else rivals Bowie for glam costume insanity? I mean, Todd is just way, was way ahead of the curve in 71, 72. Yeah. Hello, It's Me comes out in 73. But, you know, you see, I don't know whether you ever saw that holiday, that, that, movie short that he's in that I wrote about in the book. You can find that on YouTube. Okay, I'll Um, look it up. Yeah, where they had glued they glued stuff to him and he couldn't get it off his skin and he's still scarred from it. Yeah, that that short (laughs) is still on YouTube. And it's like 1971, I think. Right. And he's completely tricked out with glam. I mean, you know, uh, he's really one of the fathers of glam. Todd in high school had long hair. And anybody who had long in high school had long hair in high school. I did in the early seventies. Knows that if you lived in New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago, you were fine for the mm, most exactly. part. But if you, you didn't, if you lived in suburbia, you were harassed, and you were harassed endlessly and bullied for having long hair as a guy. Hair used to be a political statement. It's yes. not anymore. Everybody has long hair. But back then, you got beat up for being a commie, a draft dodger, anti-American, queer. I mean, that all was grouped together and every athlete sort of took their turn picking on you and you kind of struggled to get home each day with either your lunch money, what was left of your lunch money or your books or your your or your, your face. But um, Todd had long hair in high school, was dating a girl and it was puppy love. They were very close and he walked, he, one day walked her home. Can't remember if he took the bus. They took the bus together and he walked her from the bus stop. But he, he walked her home to her house and coming up the driveway, her father, her crew cut ha- haired father was watering the shrubs, the plants and things it must have been June or September. And the father look, took, takes one look at Todd and turns the hose on him. And he goes, you know, <laughs> yeah. he just turned the hose on him and chased Todd away and told his daughter, don't bring somebody like that home again um, or else you're not going out ever again. And even though the daughter was upset about that, she told Todd, it's over. I can't, you know, I can't see you. She, He tried to come to see her. He, he brought her an outfit. I think it was a jumpsuit of, of some kind, if I recall. Mm. Um, again, it's in, the, it's in the book, Anatomy mm-hmm, right. of 55 More Songs. And his, his sister was home. And he said, this is for, you know, this is for Linda, or whatever her name was. And the sister took it. And when he left, he said to, he thought to himself, how embarrassing is this? I'm bringing outfits to my girlfriend's house and her sister's taking. I mean, he just realized the shame of, of it all and how, how, how he was groveling. And he wrote a song. Um, and the song that he wrote, he decided since he's in charge of writing the song, it can go any way he wants. Hmm. So right. instead of writing about how he was dumped, you know, oh, you know, the, the three of us would have written something like, I, I walked you home, my heart was with you, but your dad was there and he soaked me with his hose. You know, we, we'd be <laughs> writing stuff like that. But Todd, because he's an artist, a songwriting <laughs> artist, he says, hey, I'm in control of the song. 
I'm breaking up with her. You know, hey, you know, she broke up with me, but it doesn't have to be that way. I uh, let me let me write a song about how I would have broken up with her and maybe done things a little bit differently. Mm. Um, you know, she mm. called me and told me I can't see you anymore. Goodbye. I'm going to break up with her, but I'm going to show her the right way to break up with somebody in this song. And hello is me. Hello, it's me. Were basically the th- first three imagined words that he would have said had he called her to break up with her. Um, and that's first recorded for the first group he's in. The Nas, which yeah. Is, which is the Nas. And he doesn't sing it. I believe he's on keyboards on there, and I forgot right, who the lead yeah, singer is. Sang it. Yeah, but it's almost funerary. And what I mean by that is it's like a it's like a it's like a funeral dirge. It's very, very slow. Hello, it's me. I mean, it's just it really drags, really drags. And nothing ever happened with the song. It didn't go anyplace. But years later, um, you know, a bunch of years later, I think that was 1968, 67. 67. Yeah. It's around the time that Alice Cooper, the group, as a side note, decides to call themselves the Nas. They, right. they they have to come up with a different name because their manager tells them that there is a group called the Nas already. That's right. this group that Todd's in. Yes. Um, and so Alice Cooper comes up with Alice Cooper. But um, the Nas song, the Nas version doesn't go anywhere. And Todd has an album to put out. And while he's creating this, I think it's a double album. Something, anything, 72. Yeah, it's, double, yeah. it's a great album. If you don't own it, go listen to it on Spotify. It's worth having the vinyl just to hear it in the original in the original right. way it was. And he goes a through a bad song on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it really, this, it's true. It's like, it says, it, it rivals the Beatles' White Album, right? It's just Easily, loaded yeah. with great mm-hmm. stuff. And Todd decides, you know, that he's going to do it on for that album. And he's got people in the studio and he, you know. Were the creates... Sales Brothers on that track? Yeah, Tony, Tony, Tony were on it. I think. Yeah, I believe a, so. Okay, I believe so. But he creates these eighth notes, dun 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 dun, on right, the piano, the right? That adds this an propulsion. urgency. I'm sorry, propulsion. Yeah, propulsion, urgency, but it also has like this, <clears throat> this SOS, um, mm-hmm. uh, Morse sure. Cody kind of sound to it, right? You know, it, it's kind of, you know, there's, it gives you there's an urgency where you feel. So he's singing a ballad, really a mid tempo ballad, but it's pushing. It's pushing, you know, it's like the horse is getting, pulling the, you know, it's pulling, it's not, a horse isn't at ease. It's pulling faster than, than the car, than the person driving the cart wants to go. And, you know, it, it becomes this, it becomes a number five hit. And, you know, the thing about it, the thing about it is that song is deeply influenced by Carol King's tapestry, Todd told yes. me. Mm. And that I don't think was known at the time. Well, I know um, he was very, Laura Nero was a big influence on him. Yeah, but it was specifically yeah. Tapestry. Mm. Um, it's too late. Meaning that for, version of it, because Tapestry yeah. came later. Right, but I'm saying the version we know, we don't care about right. the Nas version. Right. You know, that, right. it's, just, it's really, if you listen to it, it's a, it's another, it's, it's, it's like, it's like seeing a great car with the tires all flat. You mm. know, it's just not, yeah. it's, there's no, there's not, no mobility there. But for this, the hit song, the, the sound of the arrangement he wrote for the hit song. Correct, Dave, to be more precise with my language, the arrangement that he came up with for Hello, It's Me um, on the 1973 hit version um, was deeply influenced by Tapestry, any of those songs. And I asked, is there anyone in particular? And he said, no. He said, it's just that it's the combination of melody Melancholy and upbeat at the same time that I liked. I liked yes. those two things that Carol King had going. Um, and for the song, it, it it's sort of like a shrug. You know, yeah. it's like it's like okay, you know, it's over, but onward. You know, on to the next. Did he say you know. the song? Maybe it's too late, baby. Because I, now that I think about Tapestry and that, it's they're very similar. It, it could be it's same too tempo, late. same piano yeah. type phrasing. Yep. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's. Yeah. It's either one of those. It's funny. I just sidebar. I just wrote about. Um, I just wrote a piece on on Carly Simon's, as you know, my, right? Uh, no no secrets, secrets. Yes. No and secrets. you know, the right thing to do, which opens that album, yes, ends exactly the same way as it's too late. 
Mm. If you listen to the two songs, if you listen to the two songs, they both have this major seventh, major ninth chord. Bump, 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 bump. I mean, they end identically. And, you know, you sort of wonder whether Richard Perry wanted that to sort of be a a salvo fired across Carol King's bow, meaning like, <laughs> yeah, sure. you know, hey, we're one upping you. Yeah, you know, this is going to do better than your song. Watch, I, I, I don't, <laughs> I, you know, it, it didn't. You know, you're so vain. Went to number one. I can't yeah. remember what what um, what um, the right thing to do um, went to. It went to into the top ten. Maybe yeah, it was the top, but not a number one. I don't right, know. but at the same time, um, I've found, I've always found Carly Simon's to be better. I just mm. like it better. I just, mm. it, it feels more, it, fe- it just feels sexier. I don't know how, you yeah. know, I'm just talking personally, how it, it just makes me, it, you know, it's like if your first girlfriend could sing, she'd sound like Carly Simon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it just has this, it has this really interesting feel to it. Anyway, getting back to Hello, It's Me, those eighth notes, you know, uh, as Dave reminded me, it, you know, it creates this sense of urgency. And, you know, if you listen to it on the album, you can see, or I think there, there's a version on YouTube, but I think it's the album version too. There's like a, a couple of false starts. Yes, there is. Yes, they on count the album. off, and it right. get, it's not quite right, and then right. they do it again: two, three, four. No, bum, no, bum, no. Yeah, bum, right. And it, it's not quite right again, and then the third time, and that all takes place within about thirty seconds. Right? Yes, yes. But it's just right. this wonderful bit of raw fabric at the beginning, so you could almost hear. Um, it feels like you're in the studio with him. Right. It's almost like it to me, and I told Todd this and he left, it feels like you're looking at the engine of a great car, but you haven't seen the car yet. You know, like <laughs> it's like a Ferrari or just this great MG or something, but the hood is up and you're just looking at the engine and then suddenly somebody puts the hood down and you see the beauty of the car, the design, because you're hearing all the, the wiring on that introduction and you're hearing the false starts and you're hearing, you know, the carburetor. And then suddenly you hear the song come in and it's just this wave of beauty that washes over you. Well, it's ironic that you point that out because there is another track on that record and, and I might be even on the same side where he goes through all the studio trickery. There's, That's the it's, first, I was just about yeah, to say that it's yeah. the first song on the following side. Right. Where he yeah. says, okay, this is, you know, reverb, this is whatever, whatever. And, and of course, as kids, we didn't know. We didn't know what it, made records sound like they it's did. It's just fun to hear, you know. It's <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's this rawness yeah. where suddenly you're. It's like you're you're invited into the kitchen to yes, sort of see right. how the spaghetti sauce is made or something. Right. You know, was... you, oh wow, that's cool, you know. But oh, what's but... interesting about that little tidbit is right after that, it gets you into a almost a um a a a, a, a song that you could use in a commercial. That instrumental. <laughs> it has very similarities to um. Pepperland, actually, from yeah. uh, side two. Yeah. Uh, I would love, I would love for there to be two pianos, and I would love for Carol King and Todd Rundgren to be at each of those pianos, and I'd love for each of them to play the other song. In other words, have Carol oh, King okay. have Carol King do Hello It's Me and Todd do It's Too Late. Can't you get Wall Street Journal to pay for that? <laughs> <laughs> but it'd be interesting, you know, it'd be interesting we'll to hear. Yeah. yeah, get yeah. Rupert in on that. He'll do that. No, I, do, <laughs> well, have to, the, I have to, I have to find is... one. I have to get Elon Musk or somebody at that level to hold a party where they're paying each of them $7 million okay. to come and do that. That's the, that's the only time you'd get those people to do that. No, they would do it. They would do it. Anyway. Well, again, that album is, is worthy of, uh, if, if, through the internet, we could do all the songs on a record. Uh, that that would be one to do. Yeah, I mean, what, what your what your listeners should know is that and this is kind of cool. I set it up this way f- for this purpose. If you go to my book site, markmyers.com, m a r c m y e r s dot com, I've put up there a Spotify playlist with yes. all of the songs I've in my that, book yeah. in order. And if you keep pace with the reading. You know, if you can read each chapter in about three and a half minutes, <clears throat> you will basically keep tr- keep pace with the Spotify playlist. Obviously, you can stop the you know right. the I, Spotify I, yeah, playlist, that, yeah. but it's kind of fun to listen to the duration of the song as you're reading the duration of the chapter. Um, they're sort of like this um, r- virtual reality goggles quality to 
to hearing the music while you're reading about the exact Oh, song. I love that's what I love about that. Yeah, because it's, it's illustrated. Spotify. You know, yeah. it's like you're reading something that's being illustrated by the real thing as you're reading about the song. Also, the other thing about the book is it's a jukebox, meaning yes. I, I'm not, I don't, I never, I didn't write this so people would start at chapter one and then they only get like, Right, you can jump pages around, in and put you know. a, yeah, put a dollar bill in and hope the next day they come back and read some more pages. You can go in at number forty five, yeah, go in at I number thirty three, yeah. jump to thirty four, mm. go all the way back to fifteen. You can go in anywhere and read as much as you want, and then jump back, jump forward. You can go wherever your heart takes you. There you go, David. Wherever your heart today takes you. Okay. But me being the nerd that I am, I like look, listening to it chronologically. Because <laughs> and, if you read it, and if you read that. it chronologically, if all you did was read the introductions to each of those chapters, you'd get the history of yes. the music between 64 and 96. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, that's how that, I set these I songs is, up. That, I think, is a very fascinating way to go. It's to, and, and, and just the, the change in sonics. As each song goes, I think. Did you like those introduction? The introduction sort of set it up and, you know, set not only set up how the song did, but also puts the song. I wanted to put the song in the time frame. Yeah, that's so very important. Yeah. 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 It, it, because it makes it then makes the song itself more relevant and more meaningful to the reader rather than just, you know, Here's the here's the guitar so and so use and here's the studio they recorded it by putting it in its context and telling you what what was going on and why glam was emerging when it was emerging and why bang a gong you know it makes sense and it's so special. You've done um, that in all your books and all your writing. You always yeah, put but, things into it's it's so a very documentary important. here. Thank There's you. A, it really is a documentary. Yeah, no, no. I would never think that as a twelve year old buying Love It to Death and something anything that I would be talking about it fifty years later and it would be documented in such a way I, yeah. I, it's inconceivable back you're then. just old yeah. yeah i am yes i am yeah. anyway yeah. so all right mark thanks for being a guest hey tom dave you know I, I, the only sad part about this is i'm i'm actually going to have to write another book to see you guys again no you won't we'll we'll figure something <laughs> out are you working on what can you give us a hint of anything else you know, there's tom? a couple of things cooking all uh, but right there's nothing set yet so i don't want to I don't want to let that cat out of the bag. All right. So, well, thanks for being our guest. And David, the highlight of the interview, of course, was uh, uh, Mark's Keith Richards imitation. I think that was priced. <laughs> this is true. This is true. We will play this. Re- Actually, Keith doesn't live that far from me. Yes, I David. Go. Gives it, it, gives it a little it. flavor there, right? There gives you go. Rock and roll. It's funny. When I interviewed him the second time, um, he knew what it was for. And he, he, he calls up and he says, uh, I answer, you know, pick up the phone, Mark Myers, he says, hello, Mark, it's Keith, it's Keith. I said, Keith, how you doing, man? He goes, it's time for the anatomy, get out the scalpel, get out the scalpel, it's time for the anatomy. You know, so he was sort of having flashbacks to, to the last time we spoke when I took him by the ankles and held him over yeah. the windowsill and shook all his change out of his pockets. Um, uh, so he was prepared, prepared to be turned upside down again and have every detail shaken out about take it so hard. You know, which is a great song and, and proof positive uh, of where the real genius of the Rolling Stones was. Yeah, and that's yeah. my personal perspective. That would have made a, a classic Rolling Stones. And record. that was so sad. That was so touching. It was so sad when he was saying that to me. I don't want to. T- I don't want to spoil it for the reader, but the ending um, was so. Um, it was so blue. You know, yeah, Ke- yeah. there was so much regret and so such a a feeling of sadness and also knowing where the line was, you know, right, yeah. for Keith, that it was never going to be done by the stones and that the two were, you know, they're over here and I was over there and that you, you don't mix those. And, and, and again, going back to historical, I remember as a fan buying that record in 87, we didn't think the wrong stones were going to get back together. That was it. We thought they were done. And this is what we had. We had Keith. That's the beauty of the Stones for me. Yeah. You know, having interviewed, uh, I interviewed Bill Wyman, not for the book, but I interviewed Mick as well mm. for my last book. And what's interesting about these guys is when the Peacock show is over, you know, when you get beyond the showmanship and the mm. cool cigarette smoking, right. headbands, strutting on stage with the cape on stuff, when you when you get past that, and you're just talking to someone, you know, talking to Mick or Keith on the phone, and you're talking about art. There's a, there's a 
blueness. Mm. That you, there's a blue coloration that you reach with these guys, and you realize what makes them special. And it's this, it's this sense of grittiness, this earthiness, this, um, this tremendous sense of sadness, mm. and that they work, they, that they've that they've given up sacrifice so much for what they do meaning family time sure. downtime you know enjoying lifetime they're, they're touring and they're, they're work, constantly working on new music and you know they missed out on a lot but they did that all so that people like us would have music to listen to right what people you... forget that about artists how hard they work yeah and what they have to go through physically and emotionally to bring us the stuff that we love i mean after after music you know what's after music that unites everybody, probably spaghetti, and then that's it, right? <laughs> probably. What did you think of Bill oh, Wyman's dude. books? What do you think of his historical? Uh, uh, you know, I think they're vital, but yeah. they're you know they they lack a certain you know they don't they're not narrative driven, right? Right. You know, they're, they, so you're not. I think people only make time for books today where there's a story being told on okay. some level. Yeah. But I think as a as a as a uh, you know, as a person who acquires and annotates and details, um, it's great that a band like the Rolling Stones had somebody like Bill right, to, to gather the information archive. and document it the way he did. Because ultimately, as the years go by, um, all of these memoirs are colored. There's a coloration that, sure. they, you know, who knows if Keith got that right or he, you know, can mm. they really check? Can the can 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 the fact checkers really find out whether it was it was this particular concert work that Keith was talking about. So right. there's a lot of gray area and a lot of loose parts in a memoir. But with Bill Wyman's books, they're so screwed down tight in terms yes. of dates. What happened? Where they happened? Right. You know, what was going on? Who had the fight on which night? What was the reason? I mean, it's it's almost like um, Jack Nicholson's, um, um, you know, Jack, what, 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 um, what's the film where he's the axe, the axe, the crazy shining. axe? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. it's almost like The Shining, right? <laughs> it's like the shining level of passion on Bill's part to document everything. But like I said, when you talk to Mick for a period of time or or Keith, you realize that there is this blue streak that, rarely, mm. that you rarely get to experience unless you're getting serious about what they do rather than just a fan or just yeah. somebody – writing a quick and dirty for some music magazine. They have to get all this flavor about how stoned they were or something. Yeah, you know? sure. Unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Quick yeah. bait. And, and speaking lastly of 1972, there is a book now out called um, uh, on the, on the stone 72 tour. Yep. Which yep. was we talked about in your previous book. You 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 put the modern rock concert at 75, but I thought it was going to be 72, but it, it, it's pretty much the same. I can't remember thing. when I put the, I, you know, I, I I can't remember which. I, See, I thought it was, it was the 72 than, tour, maybe. I, I think it was because the Modern Rock concert is an indoor event, right. you know, for the most part. Um, you know, it's it's a lot of small uh, psychedelic dungeons, as Steve Miller called them, uh, right. up until 72. And then 72, you start to get... You know, I mean, Led Zeppelin, I think, is in Madison Square Garden in 69, but it's not it's it doesn't become like the Stones tour yet. You well, know, the Sto not... I wasn't 72 the first time they got corporate endorsement with Yovan, I believe. So that's really. Yeah. And also know, they, they, you know, they by then they had their branding. I mean, they. Right. They, the the T-shirt came out, really... the, um, the <clears throat> tongue. Mean, right. The, 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 yeah. The I mean, if you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't count the Beatles T in the Ringo's drum kit no, the brand, no. although the logo, you know, although it is a logo Afterwards, and the who it had a, a logo yeah. um, prior, but it's not until the stones tongue and lips that you, you know, you don't need words to Right. That was a great story in that, in rock concert, wasn't it? Um, Marshall, um, um, uh, Chess. Marshall Chess's um, descri uh, description of how he, landed on the fact that the Stones needed a wordless brand because he was driving in Europe and was going to Shell stations that didn't yeah, say Shell, exactly. but he knew right. it was Shell. Right, yeah. Uh, and he decided, you know, they, they needed they needed something that was instantly identifiable, but there weren't words. Right, you know, exactly. It was just an image of some sort. And that's when rock becomes enter an, an acceptable part of the entertainment business. It starts to become it's, it's yeah. that's when it's that's when the ship leaves the pier, yeah. uh, setting sail for the multi-billion-dollar industry.
Right, right. You have folks like Alice Cooper on Hollywood Squares and things. <laughs> well, I, I think, too, if, if, if you really give it some thought, it wasn't so much. Well, the, the date is the, the the business, which was nascent up to that point. They were still w- working out all the details. That's when they knew they could really put the screws to everyone. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, ex- except except you know Woodstock and uh, Woodstock and Altamont does does rock a very big favor Woodstock because the fear of what could have happened had things gone wrong terrified right. every community in the country and they started to pass <clears throat> new laws prohibiting that size unless you had X number of porta sands sure, and X sure. amounts of gallons of water, and Police. they really put the communities put their foot down. They wouldn't grant a license unless those conditions were met. Uh, and then Altamont sends the rock concert into new sports arenas uh, because, and and what sports arenas do for the rock business is, you don't have to worry about the weather, you don't have to worry about the temperature, um, you don't have to worry about health stuff, you don't have to it's worry a about controlled bathrooms. environment, yeah, controlled environment. And the only thing that they had to figure out was how are we going to maximize seating? And for a long time, they couldn't maximize seating behind the artist in these arenas. And right. it, it's not until the the the, um, uh, the wireless mic and the wireless guitar that they're able to do a 360 degree. Right, concert. exactly. Yeah, technology. Well, think you about need, the early Beatle concerts. And, and actually, it's were... a it's the flying hmm. junkyard that that changes everything, where. Instead of mounting speaker systems like the, the 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 dead on stage, so that the people the reason the people in the back you couldn't sell the seats is you couldn't see right, anything, right, right. And a lot of the people in the audience couldn't see because speakers were in the way. It's not until they figure out um, that the Disney on parade crews that come in to these arenas because they're the only ones capable of of staging things in in arenas, um, ice capades, you right, know, things like that. Yeah. They, they you know, say, why do you have these speakers on stage? You know. Let's get them up in the air. And they take all these speaker systems and they they call them the flying junkyard because the speaker systems look like junk. I mean, they were all different shapes and sizes. And they hoist them up with chains and they bring them all the way up to the ceiling. And now you've got a 365 degree view. And then you start to see ticket prices go go up up as well. Yeah. Right. Box Mm -hmm. office. All right, sir. All right, Mark. You're throwing me out, right? We're throwing it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, well, we'll have him back. Uh, we'll read the seven secrets, David, and then we'll talk about that. Yeah, you need you need to tell you to me, where are you going from here? Where are you going yeah. from here, Mark? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's enough. I get it. Okay. Well, we already so, did. My grand, we did. You my said you're not going to let the cat out of the, the bag. Right. So, my so. wife's grandmother used to say, like, when she was when she had enough family. Elise there, is she, a writer, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, she, you know, she she would she, her grandmother would say grandmother would say to the family, "Where are you going from here?" Which would basically be shorthand for, "It's time yeah. to go." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, guys. So you All can right, use Sagan's that now, in- for your, your next guest. You can use that. Where are you going from? What do you got? Oh, what we'll are you do doing? That. What are you doing later this afternoon? All right. That's what like- else have you got to do today? What are you doing in five minutes? <laughs> your, pro- your problem is your problem is it's a pre-holiday week, so I have nothing going on except writing this afternoon. Oh. All right, there you go. All right, All right we'll guys. See. Great see you on happy happy holidays, holidays, of course. I'll write as fast as I can to get my new, next book done so I can see you again. Uh, but but for, for the time being, I'll see you on Facebook. Great, great uh, job, guys, as always. All right. Yeah. Really great, great to see you, too. Okay, Dave. Right. Take care, man. See, see you. Chris, out. Bye-bye.